I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on Microsoft's Cybersecurity Story. I'm going to hand things over now to our Cybersecurity Product Manager here at New Horizons, Mr. Buck Chell. Thank you, Kelly, and I'd also like to welcome everyone. I'm Buck Chell, the Product Manager for Cybersecurity at the New Horizons Corporate Office. And this is our 10th and final cybersecurity focused webinar that New Horizons is running this month in October, which has been designated by the Department of Homeland Security as National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, this is an annual campaign now in its 15th year with a goal of raising awareness about the importance of cybersecurity. National Cybersecurity Awareness Month is a collaborative effort between the US Department of Homeland Security uh, and its public and private partners, including the National Cybersecurity Alliance, uh, to raise awareness about the importance of cybersecurity and individual cyber hygiene. New Horizon Cybersecurity Month is now in our third year as an annual campaign, as Focus Month, and the goal of our Cybersecurity Month webinars, which are done in conjunction with our industry partners, is to provide you with input from subject matter experts to share the latest information on cybersecurity to help enhance your organization's cyber resilience and overall cybersecurity posture. Uh, we have a Cybersecurity Awareness Month landing page that you can find on all your local New Horizons websites, which you can find by going to www.newhorizons.com, uh, going to find a location at the top of the page, and then uh, you'll find the Cybersecurity Month landing pages under Promotions, where you can find a full list of all our past cybersecurity webinars, the recordings that we've done this month, along with free downloadable cybersecurity resources, the 10 cybersecurity webinars that New Horizons has been hosting over this month cover different aspects about today's ever-evolving cyber threat landscape. Today, we're gonna to take a look at Microsoft's cybersecurity story. And we're delighted to have our presenter from Microsoft, Mark Gable, who is a cybersecurity cloud solution architect at Microsoft. Welcome, Mark, you now have the floor. Thank you very much, Buck, I appreciate it. Thanks for everyone uh, having me today. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about uh, Microsoft's cybersecurity story. Uh, this is going to be a slightly different presentation than maybe what you've seen in the past as we've recently updated our cybersecurity story um, based off of uh, some announcements that we had a few months ago at Ignite. So um, as Buck mentioned, my name is Mark Gable. I'm a cybersecurity cloud solutions architect here at Microsoft. And uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about how Microsoft enables you with the intelligence that you need to protect, detect, and respond uh, to today's cybersecurity landscape uh, with Microsoft uh, 365. So with that, uh, we'll get started here. So what do we at Microsoft mean when we talk about providing security for your digital transformation? I know you've heard that a lot from us. Well, we're really operating in this world of intelligent cloud and intelligent edge currently. Now, this is kind of how at Microsoft we see the world evolving. And we see it evolving into this set of intelligent cloud services and these services have a great deal of computing power and storage and intelligence behind them. And then there's this other set of intelligent edge devices. And these span everything from your IoT devices that are coming out rapidly right now, to PCs, to mobile phones, tablets, and so on. And there's a lot of intelligence on these edge devices, but they typically have less storage capacity and less computing power than the cloud services. And then together, these two intelligent uh, tiers form this intelligent world, and they work together as a unified system. So this is the world that many of our customers are moving to with their digital transformation. And when it comes to defending against cyber attacks in the intelligent cloud, intelligent edge era, we really have to consider what is our digital landscape. How do we think about what our assets are and what do we have to defend against in this new digital estate? This is a little bit different than how it was about five or 10 years ago. IT organizations now are finding themselves responsible for protecting a set of technologies that they might not even own. This can be things like user-owned mobile devices that are used to access your corporate data. It can also include systems and devices that your partners and customers use to access your information. And any one of these points within this digital estate can be a point of vulnerability for your overall estate. 
And that changes the game when it comes to security. We can no longer draw those perimeters that we used to around our organization. And this is a challenge that we're all struggling nowadays with cybersecurity. And it's a challenge we at Microsoft think that we're in a unique position to be able to help you out with. One of the big challenges in security is that the market is very fragmented and very confusing. There are dozens and dozens of categories of solutions, and within each one of these categories, there's dozens and maybe even hundreds of solutions to choose from. If you went to a major security conference right now, you'd find over 150 different types of security controls being represented. You'd find everything from antivirus to endpoints to cloud security technologies. And you'd find this from over 500 vendors that exist within this landscape. And this leaves many of our customers struggling with just trying to figure out how many of those solutions do I really need to put in place? Adding to the confusion, the threat landscape is continually evolving. It's evolving at a very rapid pace. We have a really wide view of this evolution because Microsoft's business spans such a wide array of audiences and technologies. And using that view that we have across these wide array of audiences and technologies, we publish a report every six months, and that report is to provide an update on what we've seen across that wide view. And we call this report the Security Intelligence Report. And as we look back across the last couple of years in the report, we have a few macro level trends that we've seen that have stood out. First, identity-based attacks are up 300% this year alone. This is because identity now is the true key to securing any one of those elements in the digital estate diagram that we looked at earlier. You need to be able to know the identity of the person who's trying to access that information or that application or even that device. In some ways, this is really the last bastion of control for many IT organizations. Identity now has become the essential control plane for security. Attackers understand that, and that's why they're so heavily focused on stealing credentials nowadays. Once they have a valid username and password, they can then work their way toward their ultimate goal, which is generally your information. Information is, after all, your most attractive target. We're no longer protecting against the hackers or the script kiddies who launch attacks for fun and notoriety. The attacks you're really protecting against today are now trying to steal something from you for monetary gain. And information's most likely what they're trying to steal from you. Making matters worse, one implication of the new digital state is that information's gonna move. It's gonna move in and out of those systems that your IT department controls now. What's going to move, uh, that information is going to move onto mobile devices. It's probably going to get emailed to people outside your organization. And it's also going to go to partners and customers. And so what this means, the actual size of your target is actually growing for those attackers. The third trend is that attackers are now heavily using automated tools and other sophisticated methods to help their attacks spread incredibly quickly. That means it's difficult for a human or even a team of humans to be able to keep up with these attacks. We're seeing currently that about 96% of malware that we detect is automated polymorphic. So what that means is it changes its look and shape every time it infects a new computer. And this means it's escaping a lot of the traditional types of detection with security tools nowadays. And this is just one example of how attackers are using automation. They're using automation in many, many other ways as we're starting to see. But lastly, many security operations center analysts are finding themselves completely swamped. And this is because they're using more than 60 different security solutions on average. And those solutions aren't integrated with one another. This is why so many of our customers today are telling us that they're experiencing talent shortages. It's already difficult enough to find security talent within today's marketplace, but they're also finding it very difficult to train, hire, and retain good quality security operations analysts and engineers. 
to help cut through all the confusion and clutter, let's distill this problem down into a Q feet, Q, ugh, ugh, excuse me, a few key strategies for success. The number one is that we recommend is to adopt an identity-based protection. This is just absolutely critical as a starting point for a strong defense against today's attacks. The second strategy is that you need to protect information wherever it goes. As documents and email move around inside and outside of your organization, the protection really has to go with it. The third strategy is to detect attacks faster and automate your response. As attackers are out adopting automation for their techniques, you need to make sure that you have automation in your corner also. Prevention is still every bit as important as ever, but even the best protections can be beaten. So this is why we need to be able to quickly detect attacks and we need to be able to automate our response in order to speed the way that we respond to these types of attacks. And the last strategy here is that you should use tools that integrate the investigation experience for your IT and your security teams and to try to provide guidance for them. Their time is increasingly a precious resource and we need to make the most of it. And this is why it's important to utilize tools that integrate the investigation experience across all surfaces that the attack is touched, from the endpoint to the desktop or mobile device, to the identity that was actually used for the attack. Being able to look across all those different surfaces and to understand the attack is really important to effectively deal with the attack, especially as these types of attacks get more and more sophisticated. But more importantly, having guidance is also very important because the techniques for defending are changing on a daily basis. And it's very difficult for your IT and security personnel to keep up with how they should defend against these latest types of attacks. So these are four strategies that we think are useful to help focus your energies on your security investments. They are also the way that we focus on our research and development for all of our investments at Microsoft. At Microsoft, as we operate our cloud services for our customers, we really think about our responsibility as even being broader than that. It includes privacy and control, making sure that you have control over your data and that you know what's happening to it. Transparency that you can achieve your, so that, that way you can achieve your compliance objectives that you need to and that you have the reliability that you can count on for cloud services. These are all different things that we look at as we run your services, but today I want to focus just on the security piece of it, in particular, how you can approach this challenge for your ever-evolving digital estate. At Microsoft, we spend over a billion dollars a year on security-related technology. And the way we think about security is, how can we at Microsoft do something that's unique that other parts of our ecosystem are not able to provide. And this is what additional capability of things that we can layer on top of what our partners have already created. So that, that way we're helping fill gaps that may exist out there from a security standpoint. And this really shows up in three different areas. And those areas are intelligence, platform, and partners. The centerpiece of our investment in intelligence is what we call the Microsoft Intelligent Security Graph. And this is how we describe the way that we synthesize the vast amount of data that we receive from a huge variety of sources. For an example, we view over 400 billion emails that get analyzed by our Outlook.com and our Office 365 services every month. 1.2 billion devices get scanned every month by Windows Defender. That gives us a great deal of signal into what's going on at our endpoints. And where are the attacks and what do they look like these days? We operate over 200 plus global cloud consumer and commercial services. Everything from Outlook.com to Xbox.Live to Office 365 to Azure and so on. And with all of those services, we have a tremendous amount of surface area that we have to defend against ourselves. 
And so do our customers. Enterprise security from Microsoft is employed by over 90% of the Fortune 500. And so we see attacks more than other companies see on a given basis because of that really large security area that we have. We also get a lot of information from having to defend against those attacks. 750 million plus Azure user accounts give us a tremendous insight on how the people authenticate against Azure. And that combined with the 450 billion monthly authentications that we do with Azure Active Directory and Microsoft accounts really give us some tremendous insight into what normal behavior looks like when it comes to sign-in authentications, and more importantly, what abnormal behavior looks like. We can learn a lot about defending uh, that very important control point, your identity, by just looking across this massive data set that we're starting to collect. Bing also scans about 18 billion web pages every month. So this gives us great insight into what people are doing with web scripting technologies and also when it comes to attacks and phishing campaigns. On top of all this, we layer shared threat data that we receive from our partners and from the researchers here at Microsoft that are part of our 3,500 plus people that work full time on security at Microsoft. We also combine law enforcement agency data that we partner with and also data through uh, we get worldwide through our digital crimes unit as well as botnet data that we collect through digital crimes unit. All of this intelligence is what makes up what we call our intelligence security graph. And if you're like me, you're probably wondering why did we call it a graph? Well, we call it a graph because it's really important that we connect these individual pieces of data so that, that way these signals are just not individual points of information. The graph brings them together as something that we can draw patterns across. And this allows us to learn from one point of data and then use that information we've learned to influence how we interpret another point of data. So the intelligence security graph is really something that we're very, very heavily invested at here at Microsoft. And it's something that we feel is very unique to us in this industry. And it's not just about machine learning and artificial intelligence. Those are important and, of course, central to our efforts, but it's also about people and the experts at Microsoft to interpret this data and do the investigative work on incidents that only humans can do. Those security experts are in what we call our Cyber Defense Operations Center. They defend all of our services, such as Azure and Office 365, on behalf of our customers. But they also have an important role as they defend Microsoft's IT infrastructure on behalf of Microsoft. So we, they, can, they protect the both sides of the coin here. They protect all of our services and they protect our own infrastructure. And so what we did for this important role that they're doing, we've combined them into the same building with our digital crimes unit we mentioned earlier. And that way all of our human brain power can work together on some of these tough security problems that we have. We believe that we have best in class operational security. We can provide continued advance, uh, we can provide and continually to advance the state of the art by performing these operations on a daily basis. And we share that information and intelligence that we have with our customers through both in the form of information of how we do it and how you might structure your own operations. But we also share that information as we continually involve the Microsoft Intelligence Security Graph so that everyone can benefit from that. So that's the intelligent piece of our investment, and it informs everything that we do in these other two areas we're going to talk about. So let's go dig into the platform piece now. The platform has two sides of a coin. The first side is a secure foundation for our cloud services, and this is about how we operate cloud services, Azure, Office 365, and so on. We have some of the world's best physical security with high perimeter fences, 24 by 7 365 surveillance, multi-factor biometric authentication at all entry points, 
full body metal detection, and so on. And we provide secured building environments within those buildings so that we can secure our server environments. To enter a server environment, for an example, a person would have to pass through multiple physical layers of security and provide multiple forms of authentication. They also have to be scanned for metal in their pockets to make sure that they're not bringing devices into a data center to steal information. So there's a great deal of physical security in place, and we do that on behalf of all of our customers in our cloud services, and that makes it possible for customers to really leverage the investments that we made in respect. Operational security. I touched on this a minute ago uh, when I talked about that human piece of the intelligence security graph. And one of the ways this really comes to life is in our continual testing of our services, making sure that we're finding vulnerabilities faster than the bad guys can. And so how we do that is, excuse me, we have a big focus on red team and blue team exercises here at Microsoft. If you're not familiar with those, the idea is that we have dedicated security professionals whose job it is to act like the bad guys or attackers, and they're constantly trying to find ways to penetrate our services and to find ways that attackers might attack us in new, unique ways, and then our defenders work to defend against those attacks so that we can shore up our defenses. Another example of our operational intelligence is around restricted access. When Microsoft employees have a need for elevated access so that, that way they can do maintenance on a service or so that they can investigate a customer support issue, they only have access to exactly the resource that they need to have access to and only for exactly the amount of time that they need it. So they have just in time and just enough access to do their work and then they get back out they don't have any standing level of access that allows them to view customer data, and all of their access is logged and tracked as they perform their duties. And this is something, again, where we can make an investment at Microsoft that gets heavily leveraged because all of our customers get the benefit from the same investment. Lastly, our customer controls are a very important part of this. This is something that we get asked a lot when we talk to our customers about cloud services. One of the questions that comes up are, what are the things that I have in my control so that I can decide how I want to manage my data and access to it? Well, access controls, of course. They're the very foundation of how we provide that. And an example is having multi-factor authentication enabled for admins who are in charge of operating Azure or the operating the Office 365 environment. Encryption key management capabilities are also in place to allow customers to decide how and where they want to encrypt their data at rest and in transit. And this allows them to also be in possession of the encryption keys so that that way there is no way that anyone at Microsoft can view their data. Even if there was a rogue bad actor inside of our organization somehow, they still would not be able to access customer data because it's been encrypted with a key that only the customer holds. And lastly, network and distributed denial of service protection is in place for all of these services that we provide. We do a basic protection to ensure that all of our services work reliably, and Azure customers, though, can also take advantage of additional protection at the network layer to suit their needs. The other side of the platform coin is built-in security, and we make that an important part of our products. This is about building in security tools and technologies into things like Azure and Office 365, Windows, our EMS product suite, and Office clients that we offer to our customers. Our investments here are really guided by four strategies for success that I mentioned earlier. The first one, of course, is identity and access management. In identity and access management, the basic question is, how much control do you really have over access? Also, can those access control policies change depending upon conditions? 
So for an example, I might be a trustworthy employee of Microsoft today, and I might be able to access certain sensitive information. But tomorrow, I might be a slightly less trustworthy employee, and you might not want me to have access to that same information. So can your access control policies adapt to those types of changing conditions? Can you make decisions on the fly? This is a technique that's being championed by many security industry experts and analysts. Some of the security analysts out there refer to this as adaptive security. The identity space is the primary control point for this capability currently. The second question to ask, to ask yourself is, can I make my access protection stronger while making things easier for users? This is about how people sign in and how we authenticate that we are who we say that we are. We find that across all of our analytics, as we look at all of those 450 billion authentications that we process every month, that proper authentication of username and password is just not a very good predictor of a genuine person being authenticated. In other words, just knowing the username and password doesn't really prove who I say that I am. And then lastly, we ask, how do you protect your user credentials? This is really about keeping those credentials protected once they're utilized, so that when they're stored as part of an operating system session, for an example, they can't be hijacked by an attacker and then used for other things that the genuinely legitimate user is not trying to access. So, our approach to identity and access management is really threefold. Number one, protect the front door. Make sure that we have the best authentication that we can, and make sure that we can do more than just passwords, and also try to work towards a future of no more passwords. Number two, improving user experience while maintaining that security. To get to a no passwords world, but also to make things easier for the user so that they don't have attacks associated on them as we try to improve our security. And number three, safeguard those credentials so that when they're used as part of an operating system session or an application session, that they're well protected. One of the really important concepts that we talk about here is the one I touched on earlier. And this is the idea of adaptive security or conditional access based upon different risk factors. The way that we build this up for our customers and technologies is with this approach here. There's a number of if statements that we can evaluate. Is this a privileged user? Are they managed or unmanaged as far as their device? Are they using a set of credentials that we know have been found in public so that we know that they're compromised and may have been stolen? And so on. There's a whole number of if statements that we have the capability to evaluate. And then what we do is every day we collect over 10 terabytes of information here at Microsoft as we operate our services. So, this gives us a whole lot of information, again, into what is normal and what's not normal. But it also allows us to make inferences on what's risky and what's not risky. So we can apply that knowledge to help us better understand a risk level based upon machine learning and advanced analysis of our data. So we can look at those if conditions and then say, do these stack up to a high, medium, or low risk? Then we allow the IT organizations to make a decision about what is the then policy that then gets applied. So if we have a certain number of conditions on the left-hand side and I end up with a risk level of higher medium, which of these results do I want to have happen? Do I want to allow access? Do I want to require multi-factor authentication? Do I want to deny access? Maybe I want to force a password reset. Or maybe I just want to limit the access so that someone can see but not edit a document. These are all examples of things that we can do with this conditional access. And so this is how we can, can 
additionally give access every single time somebody requests access to an application or to a document or some other piece of information. And this goes to the fundamental control plane for security these days. So it's a really important concept to gather. Here's another example that we're going to take a look at. And this is going to be an example of using conditional access based upon a set of conditions. Here we have a user who's trying to access a sales information, a sales application that has sensitive data in it. We first look at the known information that we have about the user, like their role, their group, their client, etc. When we look at the current status of their device and try to determine what is it? Is it healthy? Is it fully patched? The client piece of it, what are they using? In this case, they're using a, a browser. Here in this example, however, we notice an anonymous IP address is being utilized. So we're going to automatically increase the risk to a medium. Then the next thing is we're looking at status of the device. We see an unfamiliar sign-in location for this user. So this causes us to raise the risk level to high. And the reason we do this is this high-level risk condition that we see here is also known as impossible travel. And so since we notice that this impossible travel, where we get that information is, if you look to the left, we've noticed, last noticed the sign-in of two hours ago from the London, UK. And we see a current location in Asia. Well, we know that it's physically impossible for that person to be able to travel from the UK to Asia in that period of time. So that's why we flag this condition as impossible travel. And in this case, the then piece that we've done is we've decided to block access to the application and force a password reset on the user, thereby protecting the data in the sales application. So let's talk about the second piece of our platform story, and this is really around information protection. Remember, this is about protecting information wherever it goes. And so the question for our customers is, do you have a strategy for protecting and managing your sensitive information? Do you know where all of your sensitive data resides? Now, this seems like a very simple question, but trust me, it's a very complex issue for many organizations, no matter what size they are. And trying to understand where is all of our information that is sensitive? Where's it located at? This can be a huge project upon its own. I've been part of many of these projects in the past. So that leads us to the second question of, do you have control of the data as it travels both inside and outside of your organization? So when it gets shared with customers and partners via email or on SharePoint sites or other online services, or when it goes onto someone's mobile device, and lastly, are using multiple solutions to classify, label, and protect sensitive information. We find that many of our customers are, and that this is a disjointed set of solutions that don't work well together for a common solution. Our approach at Microsoft is to detect and classify sensitive information. This is really about understanding where sensitive information is located at. Data classification can be the subject of intense debate inside of any large organization. It can involve groups like your legal team, your risk management team, your IT organization, your business organizations. It can really involve about anyone who has a say into data classification. So this can be very difficult. But once you solve that problem, the second piece, and, and some people say the most important piece is applying intelligent protection based upon the policy that you created for your data classification. So knowing that the information is sensitive and what type of information protection am I going to apply to it? And what is the policy that governs that? And then lastly, monitoring and remediating. So understanding where all of this information is going. Who's accessing it? How much control do we really have over it? And what to, and <clears throat> excuse me, and we want to make sure that we do this across that whole broad surface 
of devices to applications, to cloud services, to on-premise systems. And across all those surfaces, we really need to make sure that we're understanding how we apply that protection policy. After data is created, you typically want to have a system in place to scan and detect sensitive data as it moves across your devices, your applications, and your services. In most environments, only a small percentage of the data that is created is really sensitive information. So the key here is to be able to identify and detect the data that contains the sensitive information or the information that you really care about. Once sensitive data is detected and identified, you need to be able to classify and label that data in a manner that reflects its sensitivity. Even if the data is considered sensitive, there's typically different levels of sensitivity. So you may want different actions applied based on that level of sensitivity. An example of that is, let's say a document contains employee numbers, ID numbers. And so you might label that as confidential. However, if that same document contains social security numbers, you may want to label that as highly confidential. Once the data has been stamped with a sensitivity label, your company should then be able to apply the appropriate policy automatically onto that data. This will include one of several protective actions, such as encrypting it or restricting rights access to it or applying visual markings or a watermark to the document, or applying data loss prevention actions such as blocking the sharing of that document. Whether the data stays in one place or moves around, it's critical that IT has the ability to monitor that data access and sharing and the usage so that, that way they have the ability to quickly respond to potential abuse or threats against that data. This monitoring can be in the form of real-time alerts, emails, or a reporting dashboard. Finally, depending on the sensitivity of the data and your corporate defined policy, as the data ages, it's subject to expiration, retention, and even deletion. And this is an important aspect of your overall information protection policy. And it's part of those policies that are sometimes forgotten about and the more difficult one to enhance. And you want to be able to apply those expiration, retention, and deletion uh, policies to that because as sensitive information continues to persist in your environment longer than necessary, it can pose a potential risk if it's discovered or compromised. Now, let's talk a little bit about threat protection. This is in some ways the classic idea that many people have when they think about cybersecurity issues. The interesting thing about threat protection is it's really a means to the end. You wanna make sure that you're protecting against threats because they're the way that the hackers and other attackers are trying to get access to your information. So the question in this area is, how do, you how do you protect your organization from advanced threats? How quickly can you detect suspicious activities on your network or devices is the question here. This is really about understanding that at some point you will get breached. It's not always about deflecting attackers or preventing attacks. Those are really important things, but no single solution can ever be 100% effective. So, Knowing and understanding that at some point your defenses will be breached, it really comes down to then how quickly you're able to detect suspicious activities within your environment, and more importantly, how quickly can you remediate those issues. The second question is, how do you know that credentials have been compromised? We get asked this a lot. And we know that this is really important because it's one of the main vectors of attack these days. What attackers are looking for is that known set of good credentials that we talked about earlier. And that's so that they can access other systems on your network or traverse your network in some other way to get sensitive information. The third is, how quickly can you remediate these advanced threats? And this is really important here because attackers now are tremendously automating their attacks. So 
how quickly can you catch up with that automated threat? And then lastly, how do you protect your users from email threats? This is because this is the primary attack vector these days. Either a malicious attachment to an email or a malicious link or a phishing attack, a spear phishing attack, a whaling attack, and so forth. Many of our biggest attacks that we see these days come from just an email message. So, our approach to threat protection is to reduce the attack surface first. We want to make sure that we're preventing attacks wherever possible, and this means making sure that the attack surface is as small as possible. We also want to reduce the number of places where an attacker might find some kind of a foothold into a system or into a network or into an endpoint. So this means filtering out malicious coder links before they ever reach the user via email or other document sharing services. And also providing deep protection on our endpoints that includes advanced hardware-based security to help isolate critical assets from attacks. The second part is we want to detect attacks faster and block them. We can't always be about prevention. That's really important, but it also has to be understanding that knowledge of that we will be breached at some point in time. So again, going back to how quickly will we know that we've been breached and do we have the ability to respond automatically? And this is unique to Microsoft is we have this ability to detect memory and kernel-based attacks on our endpoints. That leads us to point number three here, responding automatically to breaches where appropriate. Now there's a lot of sensitivity in IT security organizations around the, uh, the idea of automatic remediation. But we think this is a very important concept to explore. And that is because as we're continuing to see attackers more automated, the only way we're gonna be able to survive the onslaught of automated attacks is by providing automatic remediation. And our approach here is to, across protection, detection, response, build our capabilities in, our security technologies, and not have to bolt them on. And whether we're talking about cloud services like Office 365, Azure, or our endpoint operating systems such as Windows, we're focused on providing built-in protection, detection, and response. And this is critical to quickly detecting those attacks across our digital estate. The last category I want to cover in this platform area is security management. And this is a tremendously important topic for a lot of our customers. So as we talk about this conversation, it's really about how do you know the security of your digital estate in real time? Remember that broad set of technologies with endpoint and sensors I talked about at the beginning of the presentation that our customers have to defend against, even if they don't own or manage some of that? So how do you know the state of security across all of them? That's a really important topic because you have to be able to detect when something has gone wrong. The second is how easily can you configure and manage your security posture across that estate? How many different security tools do you have to go to and access to be able to get that kind of information? How quickly can you get that done utilizing those multiple tools? You need to have uh, be able to treat your security operations center personnel's time because again we talked about what a valuable resource they are and how difficult they are to hire and that they're stretched so, so thin these days. And lastly, how do we proactively improve our security practices so that over time we know that they're getting better? And this is something that we think is really important for us and this is something that we think we can help our customers out with. So our approach here is to really provide visibility. That's the ability to be able to see the security across that digital estate in real time. Control is the ability to make those policy configurations easily, quickly, and also coherently, most importantly, across all of those different layers of your digital estate. Then we can provide guidance that helps the security operations personnel know what to do next. 
a lot of times security operations personnel will say, hey, this alert just arrived. I'm not sure what it means, and I'm not really sure what to do next. This is a common pers or common question that a lot of responders have when they see alerts coming in on the digital estate. We have to do this across a really broad surface area. We have to do this from our devices and our digital estate to our applications and to all the data it touches and the infrastructure itself. So this is a lot of information. And the way that I like to bring it back together is to have our customers consider a different approach. Is there a way that we can reevaluate your IT security portfolio to reduce the number of solution vendors that you have to source products from? Is there a way that we can use built-in protection so that they have less to deploy and fewer agents to manage? This is a, a big challenge with all those 60-plus security technologies that are out there, deploying, keeping those up-to-date, and managing them. Is there a way that we can speed up response by using, utilizing tools that integrate detection and exploration across the full surface area of devices and identity protection? And is there a way that we can all benefit from unparalleled visibility into the threat landscape that a vendor such as Microsoft handles? And of course, the answer here is yes. And at Microsoft, we think there is a way that we can do that. And we think we can do that with these four points that you can see above. We can handle, we can help you reduce the number of solution providers by providing you with Microsoft 365. Microsoft 365 is a package that provides all these capabilities that we just talked about into one package. We think that it can help you by utilizing built-in protection into things into like Windows or into Azure or into Office 365, so you don't have to deploy quite so many different solutions and manage all of those agents. We think that it can help you speed up your response by giving you the tools that you need to integrate across all of those different pieces of your digital estate, and that we can provide you with visibility into the threat landscape that comes as part of the intelligence security graph that powers all of those solutions that we just talked about. They all dip into the intelligence security graph, and they all get smarter and better at protecting as a result of it. So to bring this all together, Here's where Microsoft has invested across the four areas of identity and access management, information protection, threat protection, and security management. We put a tremendous amount of investment into these areas, and it shows up broadly across these array of products and features. Our identity access management tools enable you to take identity management-based approach to security and to establish those conditional access policies we talked about earlier. Our information protection solutions help you apply protection to that information and keep it as it travels around both inside and outside your organization. And our threat protection capabilities are built into the platform so that you can strengthen both your pre-breach protection and with deep capabilities across email, collaboration services, and endpoint, including hardware-based attacks and post-breach detections into things like memory and kernel-based protection and automated response. Let's take a look at the M365 Identity and Access Management Solutions. Here you can see we have Azure Active Directory that protects against the infrastructure, the identity, the apps and data area, and the devices. We have our Windows Hello and our Credential Guard technology that help protect against the devices. With M365 Information Protection Solutions, we can provide a comprehensive protection of sensitive data across devices, cloud services, and on-premise devices. And how we do that is with the devices, we have Windows Information Protection. Under Office 365, we have Office 365 Data Loss Prevention, Office 365 Advanced Data Governance, Office 365 Cloud App Security, Azure Information Protection, and then when we get over to the cloud services in the SaaS area, we have Azure Information Protection and Microsoft Cloud App Security. 
When we look at M365 threat protection solutions, what we have here is we have Azure Security Center helping protect against the infrastructure. With identity, we have Azure Advanced Threat Protection. We also have Azure Security Center, Azure Active Directory, and Microsoft Cloud App Security. Under the apps and data area, we have Office 365 Advanced Threat Protection, Exchange Online Protection, Office 365 Threat Intelligence, along with Microsoft Cloud App Security. On devices, we have Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection. We also provide advanced security through simplified and intelligent security management. And how we do that, we have the Windows Defender Security Center for the devices. Under apps and data, we have Office 365 Security and Compliance Center and Microsoft Cloud App Security. And on the infrastructure, we have the Azure Security Center. And all of these devices and dashboards are powered by the intelligent security graph in the back end. So that's the platform piece of our investments. Now let's dig in the third area here, partners. And this is not only about how we partner with our peers in the industry that provide other security tools, but also how we work with industry alliances and we work with government and law enforcement agencies around the world. And this is somewhat unique to the way Microsoft thinks about its partnership. And it's a little bit different from the other security vendors uh, and how they might be talking about it. We like to think about partnerships with our peers in the security industry, and I want to focus on one that's a little bit unique and different from what other security vendors do. As we bake security deeper into our hardware with partners like Intel, and of course our Microsoft uh, Surface devices. When you think about this, the important thing is to remember that the software layer where all of our interaction really occurs with our PCs is really a pretty vulnerable place. That means it has a broad surface area for attack, and if the defenses here fail, the entire, the entire operating system could be compromised. So we can't rely on just a software layer as the only place where we provide protection. We also need to utilize the firmware layer and some hardware-based isolation technologies that we built into Windows 10. This allows us to greatly reduce the surface area and then monitor and validate the integrity of that system. That makes it more resistant to attack, even if the operating system defenses have failed. Deepest down in the silicon layer, right baked into every chip, we're working with Intel and other partners to help reduce that surface area even more. And they can utilize this way a hardware-based implementation to make tampering very difficult. And then keep the entire endpoint resistant to attack so that, that way it's even protected when the operating system defenses have failed. There's another of other examples uh, that we partner with our peers in the industry, and these are just a few of them here. As we understand that most of our customers are utilizing those 60 security solutions a day, it's important for us to partner with our peers that are out there. And the solutions we provide here can add value and work with those existing solutions that are out there. Here you can see just a few examples of those partnerships in the four spaces we talked about. Now there's one last area that we'd like to uh, talk about, and this is industry alliances. And this one I'm gonna talk about here is our partnership with the FIDO Alliance or the Fast Identity Online. This is one of the most important ones that we work with, I feel, today. And because I mentioned earlier, identity is the most important control point for security today. And so with that, the FIDO, what the FIDO Alliance does is they work together with all of the board members to ensure that we can provide security to on-premise apps and web properties to allow for secure mobile user authentication and secure authentication. And what we really want to make sure is that everyone has, that utilizes services, whether they're on the web or on premise, will get that same experience that I have when I sign into my Surface with just my face and I don't have to utilize my password. But I still have secure authentication into every single device and application I need throughout the day with just utilizing that one secure sign-in. But this isn't just about facial recognition. It's a great, it's just an example of another great experience that we can do to help 
provide people with access to these services and websites while helping maintain secure authentication. And then we're all working together to get to that state of no more passwords. In the space of partnerships with government and law enforcement agencies, I want to highlight the work our digital crime unit does, because they're re really leading the fight against cybercrime here at Microsoft, and they're protecting people and organizations through global disruptions, for an example, like taking down of botnets and enforcement actions that they're doing with local law enforcement agencies around the world to be able to capture and to bring cyber criminals to justice. So. This wraps up the information I wanted to share with you today about the Microsoft security story and our M365 security solutions. I really appreciate you all taking the time to join my webinar today for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I have hoped that you're able to gain a better understanding of the Microsoft security story. And with that, Kelly, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Mark. And before I speak to this slide here, if anyone has any questions, um, I know we're getting to the top of the hour, but feel free to type those in and we will try and address those um, as quickly as possible. I also want to mention that if you are interested in any of the material presented in this webinar, please reach out to your local New Horizons for further information. And if you are not familiar with your local New Horizons, you can log on to newhorizons.com and do a zip code search to find the center nearest you. Also, a reminder that this session is being recorded and you will receive a link to view the session recording along with a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation later today. Um, and at this time, please feel free to type those questions in while I speak to this slide and we will address those over audio. So I want to let you guys know that we are so excited to present to you two keynote speakers coming up in November who will be sharing their stories with us. The first speaker we will hear from is national security strategist, Mr. Eric O'Neill. And Eric will be sharing his story of how he brought down the most prolific spy in U.S. history and became the subject of the film Breach, in which Ryan Phillippe portrayed him. His story is an exciting one, and we cannot wait to hear him tell it next Wednesday, November 7th. Our second keynote speaker is Mr. Dan Goods. Dan is a visual strategist for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He leads a team that is revolutionizing how NASA thinks and is always looking at things with a new perspective. He, he is passionate about creating moments in people's lives where they are reminded of the gift and privilege of being alive. And on Wednesday, November 14th, Dan will be joining us to discuss how you can include creativity in everything you do, from interactions with those around you to your career. We are very excited to welcome these two speakers next month, and registration for these online events is currently available on our website, newhorizons.com, and a reminder that they are free. So please come spend an hour with us and listen to these fantastic speakers tell their story. All right, Mark, we do have a question coming through. Um, can you provide examples of identity management? Provide examples of identity management. Um, so identity management, uh, that's kind of a broad question. Uh, I'm not sure which specific um, information around identity management uh, that the person asking that is looking for. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about around conditional access and how we can manage uh, access around those identities. Uh, identity management can also be used in Azure Active Directory to provide uh, authentication into uh, over a thousand different applications, whether those be SaaS or PaaS applications, uh, out on the web to, uh, again, help prevent that tax that's sometimes associated with being able to authenticate to multiple different different applications using a single sign-on. All right, yeah, it says um, they're looking for solutions. That was a follow-up. Uh. Uh, so, so solutions in that there, there's many solutions that are out there uh, that are available. Uh, there's actually hundreds of solutions that are available through some of uh, our partners that are out there in the organization. Our own solution is uh, utilizing Azure Active Directory uh, that would then allow you to manage the identities uh, of your people within your own organization, but then also help you manage those identities to those thousand plus applications that are out there that are either SAS or PASS uh, that you want to authenticate with using the single directory. All right. Um, and it looks like that's going to conclude 
today's uh, questions and webinars. I'm sorry we went over a little bit, but Mark, thank you so much for joining us and speaking on behalf of Microsoft and New Horizons. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you everyone for joining today. I really appreciate getting the chance to speak with you. All right, thanks so much, everyone. If you missed any of our past cybersecurity uh, awareness webinars for this month, you can access those recordings on our website at newhorizons.com under our webinar archive library. Thanks so much, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of the day. You may now log off. Have a great day.